<laughs> Good morning. How amazing was that? Um, some pretty incredible dance moves uh, that had me laughing. Uh, and the robot in the 920 service, you guys should have seen that. That was good stuff too. Um, so just good to celebrate uh, this time of year. And, uh, you know, again, just a cool visual and, and a, an understanding where Scripture just comes to life in terms of um, God saying, you know, let the little kids come to me. And, and he just, he sees what we saw. You know, just, just pure hearts, just um, excited and receptive to who he is. And so we celebrate that at this time of year. We've been going through a series entitled No Reason for the Season, um, four installments, and this is the final one here today, just um, talking about things that can kind of actually intercept what Christmas is all about. And uh, this one might seem kind of funny or catch us off guard because uh, when you think of family, like that typically has, you know, nice connotations, and when you think of Christmas and family, that, that should be a, a good thing, and it is. Uh, but we also recognize that sometimes even good things, maybe even arguably more often than not, uh, good things can get in the way of God. Um, and and um, we settle for good things instead of the best things. So we want to look at that and analyze that a little bit in our moments together now. Um, something that's cool for, for me, I think for all of us, we get to reconnect with family during the Christmas time. And uh, even if family is close by, like we're in the same area, vicinity of families here, uh, there's still something amazing about time that's carved out over Christmas. There's still more intentionality over this Christmas break where we connect with family, even family that's close by in a special way. It's unlike any other time of the year, and it's really special. And today we're going to navigate how to spend time with family and still have God in the center of all of that. What we'll also do is elaborate on it and expand on it and recognize um, for us as followers of Christ, uh, just even that whole concept of a, a spiritual family and, and how does that play into things. And uh, we'll, we'll take some moments looking at that as well. So I'd encourage you just to bow with me in prayer and uh, we'll um, offer ourselves to the Lord in these moments together now. Let's pray. And God, I want to thank you so much for Christmas, for uh, what it means to us, um, and for the fact that it's meaningful because of what you did for us. Um, you've included us into your family, and um, there was a, a significant cost involved in that, a, a tremendous display of love through you coming down to earth and, and becoming a baby, becoming humanity, so that relationship with the God of the universe could be restored, because on our own, God, we're broken, um, we're, we're human, and we needed a savior, and uh, you provided that for us. And uh, so we celebrate that every year, um, every day of the year, but it's just a heavy concentration during Christmas time, and we're grateful today. As we contemplate uh, the concept of family, Lord, would you go before us and just give us wisdom in how to um, honor you in our families and, and to um, just have that on display during this Christmas season as well. We offer ourselves to what you have to say to us in these moments together now and pray this all in your name. Amen. You know, as we think about family, um, there's two aspects to that, right? Um, family can be good and family can be bad. And I, I just wanted to touch on that a little bit. Our, our family situation can be one of those two things. Uh, if yours happens to be good here this morning, um, what I would encourage you to do is not allow that to replace what is great and uh, great is God. And, and here again, that's, that's just a reminder I touched on it uh, by way of opening remarks. I think that that can often happen. We just, we settle for good, and, uh, and we miss out on God because of, of just focusing on something that seems good enough to us. And, and you might be in a situation where your family dynamic is really good. Uh, what I'd also encourage you to do if that happens to be the case is not to take that for granted. You know, thank the Lord for an amazing family situation if that is what you have this year. And, and we'll um, elaborate on that a little bit more in a moment's time, but I, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about others who might be able to relate more to this quote that I found and came across. It says this, you know, friends are relatives that you make for yourself. And uh, that whole, you know, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family concept, right? So uh, there, there's just something about being able to pick your friends. You, you can kind of create your own family. You, you can pick and choose 
who you like to hang out with and, and they become friends. Family, we don't have a whole lot of say in that. You know, we just kind of, we, we inherit that. Literally, we, we're born into a family situation and we don't necessarily get to pick who our, our brothers or our sisters are, for instance. And uh, you know, those are things that we can't control. Um, your family situation as a result may be one that's, that's tougher for you and you might be in the room and you might have a hard situation. Say like if you've got this really for example, like this really amazing daughter in grade 10 named Natalia, and this absolutely amazing son in grade 8 named Ethan, but, you know, you have this wife named Andrea, and she sometimes <laughs> gives you dirty looks in public and shakes her head disapprovingly, you know. <laughs> what, what do you do? I mean, situations are bad. What can you say? Uh, some of you might have that. And... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, okay, sorry, seriously, um, you might have a family dynamic that's even worse than mine, and uh, that I will pray for you, because uh, I might be in trouble, I might get some gifts returned, I'm not sure, but we'll, we'll talk after the service. Um, in all seriousness, you might have a dynamic that you're not looking forward to during this Christmas season. And I would just encourage you, if that's your scenario, if your family situation's awkward, or it's hard, it's, it's difficult, uh, maybe you, you've come through a year where um, your, your family split apart, you know, and, and you're separated or divorced, or, or there's just there's tension in your family situation. I'd encourage you if that's if your family situation is bad, if if you choose between good and bad, it's bad. Um, let God be your family. Let Him be your heavenly Father. Lean heavily on Him over this holiday season. Another way that we can do that is to look to the body of Christ, and we have a spiritual family, and and we can lean heavily on one another, and that's a gift. And the church, being the church, um, offers up family for us. And that's just a reminder for us as the church today as well. Those of us in the room today who are followers of Christ, we have a responsibility um, to look around and know who our friends are. And, and just know uh, people in the room today who are going to have a difficult Christmas and just come alongside them and minister to them. James chapter 1, verse 27, I think is a really cool verse in relation to this. And it says this, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father, and interesting there too, God the Father, right? Him as our heavenly Father, Him as our family. Pure and genuine religion to Him in His sight means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. And so we have a responsibility as a church you know, to, to help out those who are orphaned or those who are widows and, and come alongside them in their times of need and, and when they're stressed out and, and not let the world corrupt us, to, to, to be an example to them and, and help them along. You know, I thought of this verse and I thought of it in the context of this morning and I thought maybe this verse, um, obviously, like we hear that literally and, and literally help those who are orphaned or widows, but maybe it's not just there. It maybe also extends to those with dysfunctional family situations. You know, we, we can have that as well. Those within the room today who feel ostracized by family, those who feel orphaned or feel like a widow, although other family will be in the room around a Christmas tree, uh, they won't be alone. They'll be together with family, and, and yet they'll feel alone. They'll feel orphaned. They'll feel like they're completely alone in a room full of family. Uh, maybe there's a family member who's, who's a black sheep of the family. Um, maybe you are the black sheep of a family. And, and those can be lonely times, and it might be heightened as you see other family engaged and hanging out with one another. And we just need to be aware of that and care for those people. Um, if you're in a situation and, and you have a sibling, for instance, who's, who you're just wincing about having to hang out with this Christmas season, you're, they're just someone that's hard to get along with for you, um, be mindful of this verse. Care for them if they're alone at Christmas time. Show them the love of Christ. That's something that's pure and it's genuine and God looks upon that favorably. If you care for family members who are alone, and quite often it's maybe self-inflicted or deserved, um, and, and there too, in those scenarios, that, that's all the more reason just to pour out grace and love, something that they don't maybe deserve. Um, just, just extend God's love and show it to them that way. Here's another situation where your family might be lonely or it might be a bad Christmas for you in that context with family. You know, family might be far away. It might be the first Christmas or a number of Christmases where family is just geographically far away from you and so Christmas is tough with that. 
Or maybe you have family that's no longer with you. Maybe over the course of this past year, you've lost a family member and, and you're bracing yourself for a very difficult Christmas. Or maybe it's been a number of years without a family member and it's still hard. You know, the reality is this, we can't control our family dynamic as much as we would like to. You know, and as much as we would like our parents to be with us forever, um, they, they'll grow older and, and they'll pass away. Our families might also be in a state of flux. You know, relatives are connected to relationship after all. Uh, families are made up of human beings. And human beings are flawed, we make mistakes, we're in relationships, relationships go up and down. You know, a great Christmas last year may have transitioned into an awkward one this year just because of family, because it's made up of people, uh, because the relationship went south. So today remember that we all have family, but only God can fully satisfy and be an enduring experience of true relationship and perfect relationship and something that's constant and unchanging. God's the only one who will never wobble on that. He will be the one who is family in a stable way and in a great way. So we've got good family, we've got bad family. If it's good and you're celebrating that this Christmas season, that's awesome, but don't settle for that. Don't settle for good, look for great. If your family situation this Christmas is bad, don't feel bad. God can cover off and he can, he can fill in the gaps that are there and so just lean heavily on him if this will be a difficult Christmas with a family dynamic. Another aspect of family, I think, is, is this, just recognizing that we have individual family units and they're called homes. And uh, that, that looks different and it's unique for all of us, what, what our home is and, and what the makeup of that is. But um, what I would encourage you to do, and, and for myself as well, is not to look to the church to supplant you as a parent, okay? Don't look to the church to replace you as a parent um, or abdicate you of your responsibility to lead your home. The church shouldn't supplant you as a parent. The church is here to supplement you as a parent, to come alongside you and help you as a parent. So that's the difference. Don't see it to supplant you, but to supplement you. The primary involvement in the spiritual development of our kids should come from us as parents. It's not the church's job to raise our kids for us. Now having said that, as a parent, I recognize and I really value what the church offers to me personally. You know, if I'm made into a better person, personally, that's gonna help my family out. If, if I'm a better version of Mark, then I become a better dad and, and a better husband by default. And, and that's something that, that happens. And that's not to mention the amazing ways that the church comes alongside our kids and reinforces what they should be hearing and seeing at home already. And, and so it's, it's always great, and I value that as, as a dad. When they come to church, and they hear something, and, and my kids are able to say, man, that's, that's what dad said. Hmm, maybe I should consider that a little more closely, or that's kind of cool um, that that's reinforced here. And, and it, it's just helpful to us as parents when that message uh, you know, of how to follow or track with God follows from the church setting. You know, I look at even what we celebrated here this morning. These kids up on the stage was a blast. Um, it, it is always just fun to see how, how that is gonna go. And um, I, I remember it just seems like last Christmas that that was my kids here on these steps. You know, and it was Angie and I nervous about whether or not they'd be behaving themselves. And, uh, and you know, now they are in grade 10 and eight. And, and it's just been great to see the journey and, and to see what God has done in their lives as a result of church. And, and that starts here. It starts with them hanging out at, at practices together to, to do something special for you and I. And they hang out with friends and and make friends and and become buddies and sing songs that introduce them to who Christ is and who he could be for them. And that's a good thing. There's another example I think of. You know, I I remember being in a small group study years ago when when Andrew and I were just starting out as parents and and we did a a curriculum that related to how to be a good mom and dad, how to parent well. And um, one of the things that still stands out for me in, in one of those sessions was just the whole concept of making sure that um, we're not parents who just focus on our kids being experientially rich, but that we also make sure that our kids are relationally rich. And uh, it was just, it was a great warning for me and something I'd never processed before. And, and the topic of conversation in the study went in the direction of, of expanding on and elaborating on the fact that, you know, in our society, we're just bombarded with the experiential. 
And, and there's just the encouragement for us as parents to have our kids experience everything. You know, to be involved in stuff, plug into extracurricular, have them involved in sports and activities and, and music and, and all these other things. They get them experiencing stuff. And, and there's a heavy emphasis on that. And, and that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but the, the warning on that or just the, the thing that was brought up in that study was the concept of how we also need to focus on the relational side and, and how often from a societal st standpoint and even right now, um, that's, that's missing and, and that's not as heavy a concentration. So I appreciated hearing that as a parent. It was a great heads up for me. You know, because we invest, don't we? Like financially, we pour into extracurricular. That takes time. Um, we're, we're involved in preparing our kids or setting them up in all of these experiences. And it just helped me to ask myself, am I financially spending, am I putting time into building into my kids relationally? Like as a dad with them one-on-one -on -one or, or with their peer groups, what does that look like? Am I, am I focused on their social environment? Who they're hanging out with relationally? Am I giving that as much attention as I am to whatever sporting event they're involved in in a particular year? And it just helped me personally to make sure that that was balanced. And that's to say nothing of the spiritual component as well. I think that that's another layer you could roll into there quite nicely. And so that was helpful for me. And that happened because I'm in church. That's why that took place. It's, that's what helped me personally. And I'm grateful to God for that. And so I, I'd encourage you as well. You know, a godly home comes by being a part of this spiritual home as well. And so I'd encourage you to, to take in church. Uh, don't miss out on that. Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 through 15. These are verses that might be very familiar to many of us. And uh, basically it's Joshua just talking about, hey, you know what, I, I'm just recognizing right now um, from, from a societal standpoint and even just geographically where I am right now, I need to declare that for me and for my home, we're following God. And he says it in this way, fear the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever the idols your ancestors worshiped when they lived beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. Serve the Lord alone. But if you refuse to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. I love that statement. Hey, if you're not gonna follow God, then you know, pick who your God is and go do that. You know, don't pretend, be all in with God or just get out of the way. It's basically what he's saying here. Would you prefer the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or will it be the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And here again, put into context today, you know, will it be this? Will it be the gods of the Amor Amorites where you're living now or, or is it gonna be God? You know, and for us, just to put it in our context, you know, is, is it gonna be what people pursue in Lloyd Minster or is it gonna be God? You know, is, is it gonna be what people in Lloyd value or is it gonna be God? And then just practically, what does that look like? Is it gonna be shift work? Uh, is it gonna be hockey tournaments? Or is it gonna be church on Sunday? You, you decide. But as for me and my home, we're doing this. Um, that, that might just be kind of a practical way for us to translate that or ask us some questions about where we're at, um, where we and our families are at. I love this comment as well by D.L. Moody. He says this, a man ought to live so that everybody knows he's a Christian. And I mean, and that's good advice. That is how we should live. We should live in such a way that people know we're Christ followers. And then he goes on and says, and most of all, his family ought to know. I thought that that was a really powerful statement because it's really easy for you and for me to be here this morning and be Christ-like for an hour and a half. You know, I, I, can, I can be godly for, <laughs> for this pocket of time. You know, we, we can do that. We can be Jesus to one another for, for our time here this morning. But who are we from Monday through Saturday? What, what do our homes look like? You know, our homes are a big reveal. Who we actually are shows up there. If someone were to take our kids aside and ask them what their mummies and daddies are like, or mummies or, and or daddies are really like, you know, and they, they just said to the kids, you know, don't worry, they'll never find out what you say, just, I just wanna know, like, what, what are your parents really like? Would that scare us if, if that was done right now? Uh, scarier still should be the fact that God does see us all the time. 
He doesn't have to go and ask our kids on the down low to find out what's really going on or to find out what's what. You know, hey, what's your family really like? God knows that. God sees us in the privacy of our own homes. In other words, our homes aren't private. Um, God sees that. He knows who we are to the core of our being wherever we are. And the impression we leave on him should be the only one that matters to us. You know, not whether or not we impress each other here on a Sunday morning, but are we impressing God? That's all that matters. And so we need to just be reminded of that, this whole concept of family. You know, if we have a godly home and every one of our family members have a godly home, then when we get together for Christmas, you know, that's, that's godly. I recognize that's the ideal. That's not always the case, but that's what we should strive for. And, and we just need to make sure that we're doing all that we can to be godly as individuals within our family, as homes within our families. And, and then God just um, blesses that, and he's, he's in on that. Christmas becomes good when that's the case. Our spiritual family, I, I wanted to elaborate a little bit more. I touched on it a bit, but I want to expand on this whole concept of a spiritual family or a church family. Because our church and, and a spiritual family really matters. We're going to look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through 26. And what I want to just say about those verses before, um, we'll have heard a lot of verse 25, um, but I want to also just have that in context, which is verses 24 and 26 as well. And so um, those, those things, when you say a, a verse or passage is in context, that just means um, that all of those verses are interwoven and they're connected together and, and they they build off of each other really nicely, and, and so we'll, we'll elaborate on that after I read the verses, but just know that they all fit together, what we're gonna see on the screen right now. Verse 24 says this, and this is what we need to do as, as a church or as people within it. Let us think of ways, so give this some thought, be creative, think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. That's what we need to do, It's what we're told to do in scripture. It goes on to say, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of Christ's return is drawing near. Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning, after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. Now here again, these verses are connected They build off of each other. Verse 24 says this, we encourage and motivate one another best when we're connected to church. Because verse 25 is telling us, you know, don't miss church. And the best way to encourage each other is when we're here and we're hearing the same things from God's word and we can spur each other on and and we're connected to the same message and we can hold each other accountable to that or or get creative or leave here with the same mindset and and know that we're going out as a force together. There's strength in the numbers of that. God just speaking to all of us at the same time with, with his message. So don't miss church. Verse 26, I'm really what it's saying here, you know, there's no sacrifice that will cover our sins if we're deliberately sinning. And, and that's a stark warning for us. Basically what God is saying here is he's saying, hey, I mean, I, I can only do what I do, but you are responsible to do what you need to. You need to respond to me. And if you say no to me and you deliberately sin, I've got nothing for you. You're not receiving from me. I, 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 my sacrifice can't cover that off. And we're separated from God. So if we neglect church, uh, really again, that verse comes on the heels of saying don't miss church. We're told that in scripture, not to do that. And so if we do, we're deliberately saying no to God. I know you tell me to do this, but I'm not interested. If we neglect church, it's a deliberate commitment on our end to sin. And without church, I know this as well, sin happens more naturally. I'll just speak to that from my perspective, and I want to clarify this, um, because here this morning, I think you can make the mistake of hearing me say that, you know, I'm godlier than you are if my church attendance is better than yours, And, and that's not the message that I want you to hear. Okay, I'm here to say that without church in my life, personally, I would be nowhere near as close to God as I am today. And me just committing to the church thing. 
um, has helped me spiritually. And I, I know that I'd be further away from God if I didn't regularly hit up church. That's, that's for me. And I firmly believe that that's not unique to me. That's the case for all of humanity. It's why God designed it this way. It's why he said nothing will stand against the church. Nothing comes against this because the people I love need it. And so I will protect this. So church matters, not only for me, but for you as well. And you might be saying, well, yeah, okay, you're in church, you're a pastor, you kind of have to show up. You know what I mean? But, but even apart from that, if I was not called into ministry, I just know from my life personally and just with my journey with God, I, I would be in on this and have been even before I was in the pastorate. This, this, was, this is my life, and I'm connected to this. It's a part of who I am. And I would encourage you even just to personalize it now. You might be saying, oh, okay, well, that's for you not necessarily for me. Just ask yourself personally and just reflect on your life right now and ask whether or not your best times of spiritual growth have happened in seasons when you were in church or in seasons when you were away from church. And just ask yourself that. When have you been closest to God? When you were connected to church or when you were kind of away from it doing your own thing? You know, I came across an article this past week and, and you know, I, I just, I get emails of, of various Christian publications and, and every once in a while there'll be one that pops up that, that talks about, um, you know, a segment of, of Christians or, or people who just say that they're done with church and they're listing off reasons to justify why. And I just read those articles and I grieve it because they're coming at it completely from the wrong direction. You know, if at the end of the day your conclusion is to leave the church because the church has failed you and, and you'll be more godly without it, the, these verses and many others in Scripture tell you that you're wrong. That's just the wrong premise. You, you can't be godly or apart from church. It's not possible. You're being directly disobedient to what God calls you to in his word. You know, I've read those articles and, and some of them are actually pretty ridiculous and I get frustrated by it, Some, uh, it's, I just shake my head and say, really, You're, you left church because of that? that? That's gonna hurt. Like spiritually, that, that's damaging, and, and I grieve that. And yet there's other parts of articles or, or concepts or reasons why, and, and some of them even sound logical to me and, and maybe even seem like accurate accusations directed towards the church as a whole. And, and again, the church at large. Um, it's made up of human beings, and human beings fail, you know, and, and so the, the church can fail you. And I, I've often said to unchurched friends of mine who say, well, I'm not sure about God, and I don't even know if he really exists. One of the first things I say to them is I say, like, I know God exists because the church does. Um, the fact that church exists is miraculous. That is God, because we're just structured in such a way where it, it shouldn't make it. And, and it does, it thrives, and, and God's in that. I see him all the time through church. So even this morning, for the sake of argument, let's say that I came across an article, I read something, I agreed and said, yeah, you know what? This argument this person makes, that was a church fail, like the church messed up there. They are 100% right in being angry with the church. Um, they're justified in it, the church blew it. Let's say, let's say I came across an article where that was the case, an individual was 100% correct in their assessment of a church situation where the church was wrong, 100% wrong. Even in that scenario, if you were to come across that or for the sake of argument, build that case, it doesn't mean that the solution is to react in a way that is 100% unbiblical. Okay, so even if you've been hurt by the church and it was 100% the church's fault, Please don't make the mistake of reacting in a way that is 100% unbiblical. Don't separate from Christ's body. It's the wrong decision for you to make. It's a bad solution. It's literally the wrong answer. I'd encourage you, stay connected to your spiritual family. It will help you in your home. It will help your family. It'll help you. It'll make your Christmas better. 
And uh, that's, that's my encouragement to you and, and what I wanted to leave you with in terms of just this whole concept of family at Christmas time. We'll look at these three statements as they relate uh, to what we've talked about here this morning. And the first one, again, is just a reminder, you know, have God central when you're surrounded by your family. And here again, if your family situation this year happens to be a good situation or circumstance, don't settle. Um, look for great. Find God, even in the midst of a good family situation. Um, if your situation is bad, don't wallow in that. Look to God as your heavenly father and just see him as more than enough. And lean heavily on God if this Christmas time is gonna be difficult um, because of a family dynamic, a lost family member, um, a family that you don't get along with is naturally, or a family that's far away, whatever your case may be. Um, just lean heavily on God if you need to this year. The second reminder is this, you know, do your part to make your home godly. You know, have church supplement you as a parent. Uh, don't look to the church to take over, um, but just to come alongside you and help you as a mom and as a dad. Because we have a responsibility before God and our kids for our kids. We're responsible for their well-being. And we'll answer to God for that. We'll answer to our kids for that. We, we need to be responsible as moms and dads to do everything we can to point them in a direction that's godly. It's what's best for them. The final point is this. You know, stay connected to your spiritual family. And as I was thinking of that, I, I was reflecting on it. And I've um, been doing a lot of that lately. And uh, this happens to be the last Sunday that I will um, be preaching here. I'll still be here for the month of January, but just in a different role. Um, a, a new position starts for me in January, and, and uh, that, that just sunk in for me. And I've been reflective and, and just looked at what the church has meant to me uh, and to our family, and we have valued tremendously uh, First Baptist Church and, and love you deeply. And so, I mean, Again, I know, I get it. Like that's the, a pastor supposed to say that, right? But, and, but, but even with putting a parent hat on, you know, and, and again, speaking on behalf of our family, there, there just there aren't enough words um, just to express how blessed we've been because of being a part of this and the spiritual family that you are. And it was a couple weeks ago in my quiet time, I was reading in Ephesians and I came across chapter four and the words just jumped off the page for me even a couple weeks ago. And, and I thought of it in, in terms of, of us here and even this day. You know, these are letters from the apostles to the churches and, and so this is Paul writing in Ephesians to the church of Ephesus. And he's just encouraging that church and saying, guys, be like this. And God placed on my heart even back then to, to read you those words from Paul for us today. And um, not that I would um, say that I'm Paul by any means, but if you could hear his words um, as mine this morning, uh, my heart poured out to you, not as the Church of Ephesus, but as the Church of First Baptist Church here in Lloydminster. This is my prayer, and I just thought it would be a really fitting conclusion for us as a church family to uh, be encouraged and inspired to be like this. And so um, Paul's words, um, my heart poured out to, to you and, and to us. Ephesians chapter four, verses one through 16. Therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you. And so uh, FBC, I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. For you have been called by God Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. However, he has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Notice that it says he ascended. 
This clearly means Christ also descended to our lowly world. And uh, I'll just pause on that verse nine. I just thought that that was beautiful. And, and again, it's just fun to see Christmas sprinkled throughout all of scripture. Notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world and we celebrate that. That's what Christmas is about. And because Jesus did that and came to us, we can be this. Verse 10, the same one who descended is now the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers, their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. And he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Bow with me in prayer. God, I would just pray that for us as a church. I would just leave that with First Baptist today. God, would you just have them so mature in their faith, just so close to who you are, just so recognizing what Christmas is truly all about, the fact that you descended and, and you have now ascended on high. You, you, didn't, you didn't just die and leave it there. You were resurrected, and, and because of that, you covered off sin, and, and you've made us what we can't be on our own. You, you've made us holy and you've made us a part of your family. Uh, it's undeserved and it's an absolutely amazing gift. I just pray that we would unwrap that. And in so doing that, that we would utilize that gift, that we would utilize the specific gifts you've given us as individuals, that we would come together and use our uniqueness to fit into something that's absolutely amazing. And, and just in strength that we would go out as a church that would influence families, that we would be a church that would um, influence one another, that we would encourage each other to love and good deeds, that, that we would just um, pull people into that, that they would see the value and importance of being close to you and living for you. God, may this continue to be a place that blesses families in the ways that ours have been blessed. And God, I bow before you grateful for the years here, for how our family is better as a result of um, being in your presence here from week to week. And I, I just pray that this church will continue to be that amazing church that you, you created it to be. Bless FBC in every way as they pursue you. And go with us now, God. May this Christmas be absolutely incredible. Now, whether our family situations are good or bad, would, would you just be there? Would we lean heavily on you during time spent with family? We offer ourselves to that and pray this all in your name. Amen.